continuous 864th week for the last 19 years and I hope to see you till we complete 1000. Thank you very much. Dear friends, I welcome you all to 864 non-stop CMEs. We can call it non-stop. I am thankful to Dr. Johan and his team to give me another chance to moderate a session. And this time, it's my duty, pleasant duty to once again introduce, I have introduced at least five times earlier, Dr. Vinita Arora, aapko kuch yaad bhi rata hai ke nahi rata. Anyway, o mujhe wohi gana hi aata gaya, dil ki baatein dil hi jana hai. Lekin, for a failing heart, it's difficult to understand. So, aise mein dil ki baatein dil se bhi jada, koi jaanta hai to wohi hai electrophysiologist. Or Dr. Vinita is one of top electrophysiologist of Delhi and I have an experience of more than 15 years with her uh, association ever since she joined Max, and she was taking care of many of my patients especially on uh, money, uh, pacemakers. So she, she is uh, very highly educated and experienced having fellowship of uh, Fellow of American College of Cardiology, Fellow of Heart Rhythm Society, Fellow of European Society, Fellow of Royal College of Physicians, and above all, Fellow of Physician Forum of India, our friend. So, I will uh, not waste more time to introduce her. I'll just uh, like to say that when heart is failing, it requires support. It can be drugs, it can be devices. And Dr. Vinita is more trained in both of them. She has equal experience in drugs and also the newer devices. So I welcome Dr. Vinita to deliver a talk and apprise us newer uh, developments in the drugs and devices. Let's hear it welcome. for Dr. Vinita. Good evening everybody. Thank you uh, sir for such a beautiful and heartening introduction. Uh, once again I would like to thank Dr. Shahan for giving me this opportunity. I always call it an opportunity because it is such a pleasure to interact with all of you. When, I, uh, when he called me up, I said yes, I am coming. Uh, this, is, this is no doubt my yes is there and uh, when I spoke to Abbott, they agreed like this. So I'm thankful to Abbott for supporting this CME. My of course my Apollo marketing team is always goes out of the way to interact with you all. And Dr. Praveen Sodi. I mean the moment I called her, I said, okay. <laughs> so she was like, Yes, I will definitely make time. She stays far away, she's made she went back home, she came from there and uh, to attend this CME because she remembered her first interaction with you all so many years ago and she had fun, she said it's such an interactive crowd, I really want to go, I really want to go and she agreed like this. So, you have so much charisma, the charisma of your uh, forum is so much and uh, I really, you know, want to appreciate the, this, this uh, effort that uh, Dr. Chahan puts in and you all put in to come here, hear us all, all talk talk and talk and then interact with us because uh, you know if we uh, do not find the audience interactive we also don't feel like going back mm. but I really love coming back here again and again Kutsi sir has asked me what you are studying but sir who is studying you? this is like asking too much from me but I am going to interact with you on the subject of heart failure. It's a very depressing subject but I will try to make it interesting. Very good. Because a failing heart is something which, which uh, you know, uh, we had given up long ago. When I was doing my MD medicine, you know, my professors, what they taught me, 
is totally changed what it is today. And you all would agree because you all have had that journey with me. You know, when we were studying and uh, we were talking about the heart failure. But there are still many, many uh, frontiers to be won over in heart failure. And uh, it is a, you know, it is a syndrome complex. It is not a single disease. It's a syndrome complex. It comes with so many complexities. So we have to deal with it. As Tara said, said Sir said that uh, medical therapy and devices come. Uh, it can be medical therapy. It can be devices. It's a combination of this. And above all, it is a combination of lifestyle modification on the part of the patient. If they do not do follow one of the uh, limbs, then the work always remains half done. So uh, I'll try to uh, make this topic interesting. Uh, but you know, whatever is the global burden, it is the global burden, and we all know that we are the diabetic capital of India, of the world. India is the diabetic capital of the world. So coronary artery disease is has diabetes as the main causative factor. So diabetes, coronary artery disease, and hence the heart failure. So patients of MI, they are increasing. The burden is so huge that uh, you know it is 2.1 million to 8.4 million, which has been estimated, uh, is the burden of uh, heart failure patients in India because of MI. Then hypertension. Hypertension used to be a disease with normal or uh, hypercontractile heart. And those hypercontractile hearts started presenting as heart failure, which is known as the diastolic heart failure thing. I will not be touching the diastolic part because that I think uh, you know medical therapy will go too, too deep in that. So uh, we will be talking of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and the animal mortality is very very high. In case patient presents with heart failure with MIH class two, 50 percent of these patients die within five years. In case patient is in class 3 or 4, that means highly symptomatic, 50% of these patients die within one year. So such huge is the impact of heart failure on the, on the population and on uh, people around. And why is India uh, you know, more high on the list? Because we have younger patients. The average age of patients presenting to us is around 50, 55, 60, which is a younger population and so you know, the mortality, of course, is high. Uh, half of these patients die because of bursting of heart failure. Half of these patients die because of sudden cardiac arrest. These two spectrum of uh, diseases, uh, the wide spectrum of diseases, both of them require care and very careful monitoring to have uh, patients better outcome. So what are we dealing with? We are dealing with a reduced infractility. We are re dealing with the reduced contractility, compromises the stroke volume, which compromises the cardiac output. So we are dealing with the, uh, you know, the, the dynamics of preload and afterload with ventricular dyssynchrony, mitral regurgitation, and plus tachycardia, that is the heart rate goes haywire. So this all is the complex things which are coming up, and we have to deal with it. Now, there are drugs which we used to study uh, in, 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 uh, during our, uh, during our uh, M -M MD time. I remember my, uh, my teacher telling me, heart failure is a disease where you only control can help the symptoms, that's it. You give Lasix to diurize the patient and you give digoxin. The beautiful drug digoxin, good old drug digoxin, which never showed any mortality benefit but was given to every patient of heart failure because the withdrawal of this drug would worsen the heart failure symptoms. And Lasix, of course, no survival benefit, but excellent symptomatic benefit. These two drugs were the only drugs that were available when I was doing my MD. When I just started moving from my MD towards my DM, well, they started, they started to be a revolutionary. First of all, ACE inhibitors came in, and they really revolutionized the world of heart failure. ACE inhibitors, there were multiple trials, SOLID was one of them, and they showed reduction in mortality. Uh, the, the survival benefit was excellently shown by ACE inhibitors. Now, <laughs> ACE inhibitors, if they do not work, they give dry cough, then it was the ARPs which came into picture. Uh, almost equal benefit of ARPs to in patients of heart failure. They started with uh, you know, the patients who were developed dry cough because of bradykine and release of uh, ACE inhibitors, but then ARBs also became our standard treatment. 
and beta blockers. I was told in my MD beta blockers are a contraindication in patients with heart failure. Do not give beta blockers. And the way things change, the you know evidence-based medicine, beta blockers are the choicest drugs for heart failure given in class one, two, three, and even in, I give in class four. Please uh, don't judge me for that. I love beta blockers. They give such a good control of heart rate that the patient's cardiac output improves beautifully. And MRA, of course, the uh, RAILS trial showed MR antagonist to be a better uh, drug and to give additional benefit from the mortality. So once the patient is ready to once stabilize on rest of the drugs, you have to add MRA. Now all these things, still the significant high mortality in heart failure remains. So we were looking for more answers. We were trying to look for more options, more answers. Where do we go? What do we do? And to our savior came the drug RV. Now RV is a beautiful combination of two drugs actually. It is Valsatan, that is an ARV and Secrebutal. Secrebutal acted on the uh, natriuretic peptide system, NPS and Reditinin and it beautifully controlled the it, The results were just, just off the table. They just took us by surprise. It is such a beautiful drug. We started giving this drug in the OPD first, on a stable patient of heart failure. That is where we started with the paradigm trial. And then the things moved on to that we give it prior to discharge. Once the patient becomes with acute heart failure, we stabilize the patient. Prior to discharge, we would start that medication. And as of now, this drug is the first choice drug for all patients of heart failure and it is showing such beautiful results not only in improvement of heart function, the reverse remodeling and uh, the GFR that it improves and stabilizes, no increased hyperkalemia and uh, even the uh, HVA1C improves the uh, need for patients being put on insulin that is decreased because it has such beautiful widespread effect. And uh, all these trials you all know, so I'll just skip these slides. Uh, just naming the Paradigm HF, Pioneer HF, Prove HF, and uh, you know all these. They started giving us study remodeling, substantial improvement in quality of life that we were looking at. So RV became our choices drug, and then to our surprise came SGLT2 inhibitors. And if you have to hear about SGLT2 inhibitors, you have to listen to Dr. S.K. Johan because that is the best talk I have ever heard on SGLT2 inhibitors. That was from him. And, the, you know, just giving you a brief uh, thing, this was a drug for diabetes. It used to, uh, uh, you know, uh, do the glucose excretion through urine. So when it started doing that, it was causing natriuresis, it was causing diuresis, so it started decreasing the preload, it decreasing, started decreasing the afterload, it started improving the cardiomyotic efficiency, and it reduced blood pressure, it reduced the weight of the patient, reduced the LD mass, and the kidney function became better. So this became a drug of choice in heart failure. Naturally, it came to a surprise that one of the diabetic drugs is actually working as the choicest drug for heart failure as of today. And these are the uh, DAPA HF and the Emperor and Reduce trial, which you all know. So I'm not going into the details. So guidelines changed. In the 2021 and 22 ACC and ESC guidelines, ACE inhibitors, ARMI, well, SGLT2 inhibitors, beta blockers, and MRAs, they became the Choices drug as class 1 drugs for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and army as a replacement to ACE inhibitor as a choice 1 drug it came in. So it is the beautiful drug which is there. This combination has been shown in the heart failure guidelines in ESC 2021. Uh, now, first of all, we have to stabilize the patients on guideline directed medical therapy. This is our first thing we have to do. We have to give lifestyle modification instructions also. Now, in case the patient is symptomatic despite this, and you see a white QRS, which is of left bundle graft topology, then you start thinking of CRP. And 
in a minute I will be talking of more things also about uh, how things have changed. Now whether the patient is in atrial fibrillation or in sinus rhythm, it doesn't matter. Even in atrial fibrillation, it doesn't, uh, the outcome is not as good as the patient in sinus rhythm, but still it is better than leaving the patient alone and not giving this patient a CRT. So this uh, thing, uh, again the heart failure guidelines continue to be the same and it has been beautifully stabilized. Now once the patient has left one of the drum, actually the patient is having a ventricular dysentery. The left ventricle and the right ventricle are not moving in sync with each other. So there is an improper LV filling, suboptimal atrial filling, delayed LV uh, contraction and abnormal septal motion. In this, of course, we know that white QRS has a higher incidence of uh, sudden cardiac death and heart failure incidence is high in patients of left bundle branch block. So it was a combination of electrical and mechanical dyssynchrony, electrical dyssynchrony as shown on the, on the ECG, mechanical dyssynchrony as seen on the echo. So we started talking about cardiac resynchronization therapy. We used to put, three, we, 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 were, we became used to putting three leads, one in the RA, one in the right ventricle and one in the left ventricle through the coronary sinus. We started reducing the QRS to a narrow QRS so that the electrical dyssynchrony which we, which we treated, treated the mechanical dyssynchrony also of the patient. We got improvement in ejection fraction, we got decreased hospitalization, we got reduced uh, incidence of sudden cardiac arrest. So uh, we passed through a lot of trials with CRT therapy and uh, they also gave us good results, very promising results but 30% of these patients still stand to be non-responders. And please mind it that only 20 to 30% of patients with LV dysfunction have left bundle branch block. What do we do in patients with IBCD? What do we do in patients with right bundle branch block? I will give you the answers to that. So these are the indications of CRT therapy, we all know this. Ejection fraction less than 25%, left bundle branch block, sinus rhythm or atrial fibrillation doesn't matter. <coughs> Symptomatic on guideline directed medical therapy. And uh, the readmission and mortality decreased with CRT, we all know. I am not going into detail of this. I am going to talk about the physiological pacing. Now to our rescue, it is the physiological pacing which has come in, where we actually put the lead at the physiology of normal physiology of the patient which means either at the his bundle or we put it at the left bundle. Once we are capturing the left bundle, we are correcting the left bundle branch block and converting the QRS into narrow QRS and giving the output which is better for the patient. This is how the left bundle branch uh, pacing is done. The anatomy of his bundle is seen there as we see on the fluoroscopy. The left, his bundle is a compact structure which has the fibers of the right and left bundle and the left bundle has left anterior fascicle, left posterior fascicle. Any of that which we capture, which is 1.5 centimeter area of left bundle, we are able to give the patient a narrow QRS. So this is one of the patients, a uh, very uh, rare missed patient of, from my side where I could not cannulate the coronary sinus, otherwise it never happens. But this was one of the patients who had a coronary sinus cannulation I tried, I was not able to do it. Then what do I do? Do I leave this patient with left bottom branch block and 20% ejection fraction there? No, I still gave him an narrow QRS. How did I achieve this narrow QRS? By the dual chamber pacemaker by putting a left bundle good lead. How do I do this? This is how I do this. I put in the left bundle lead and I check whether the left bundle lead is exactly at the position, right position. We take this dye shot and double check whether we are at the left bundle or not and we go into the EP lab. We are in the, doing this in the EP lab to see that yellow color is the left bundle potential. We map that potential, look at that potential, look at the 12 ECG and give the patient this narrow QRS. Uh, ECG result. So uh, this is another ECG of a left bundle branch block patient with ejection fraction of 30%. Now this guy did not have money. He went to at least five hospitals prior to coming to me and he said I cannot afford uh, this much. I have four daughters to marry. I cannot pay five to six lakh rupees. What do I do? 
I told him, I said, I will not give you 100% promise, but I will try to give you a better dyssynchrony with a dual chamber pacemaker, which will cost you 1.5 lakhs. So he was ready for that. Once he got ready, I did the uh, pacing, and this is the result I've given him. Within six months, his EF was up from 20% to 50%, 55%. He's absolutely in NYHA class one, and He's gone home very happily. Uh, it's been about one and a half years, and he came for a follow-up. He's very happy. So the same money, right? And a good therapy. This is another of the patient. Uh, I think it's the same patient where I gave. Uh, this is the same patient. The left bundle pacing has been done. The pacemaker has been put up. You can see it's the dual chamber pacemaker put up at the left bundle position. Okay. This is a patient of ischemic cardiomyopathy. Now, in patients of severe ischemic cardiomyopathy, he had an ICD. And his QRS was IPCD. It was not a very wide QRS, 120, but he was symptomatic with the uh, heart failure. So we went ahead and did the left bundle pacing. If you see this uh, ECG, the center ECG. Yeah. You see the center ECG. This one is the post pacing ECG, which is narrower than this baseline ECG. So these patients of ischemic cardiomyopathy patients, these improve with either hot CRT or lot CRT, which means this bundle pacing or left bundle pacing. Now what do we do about patients with right bundle branch block and LV dysfunction? These patients were a contraindication for a CRT therapy because we were pacing from the left ventricle. Mm. We used to leave them alone. If you give a CRT in these patients, they would actually worsen out. Now what do we do in these patients? Oh, I didn't do anything. Mr. Pacing Yogi, sir. This is what we did. We did the instrumental pacing in this patient and corrected the right bundle. He developed a narrow QRS and his ejection fraction subsequently improved with that. So these patients who have IVCD, who have right bundle are actually gaining from conduction system pacing. And this, uh, I just have to highlight this, that this therapy has made it to the guidelines even without randomized control trials. So there must be something in this therapy that it has gone to the guidelines and is becoming the therapy of choice. Uh, this is another patient, very difficult patient because he, she had an ICD from the right side and we have tools from to do it from the left side only. Despite that, I did this uh, venotherapy in her because she had some stenosis of the uh, of the access here. There is some stenosis. So we dilated the vein and from the left, actually right side, using the tools for the left side, I did the left bundle pacing and uh, we gave a good result of CRBD to this patient. Ultimately, she got the three leads in and she was doing well because she had an IVCD. This is the end result ECG, a narrow QRS and this is our happy team, you know, celebrating a good result of a very difficult case. Thank you. So this is another patient I just did this day before yesterday. A combination I want to tell you of a DCMP patient, wide QRS, 7.5 millimeter and diastolic uh, uh, size of the LV and systolic was 6.0. She had a single chamber ICD which needed to be upgraded because her ECG showed left bundle branch block. But such a dilated heart, I, I thought we should do a lot CRT. So we gave a narrow QRS the end result. You see the narrow QRS has come here. But it was such a difficult case. You see, the, we had to do, uh, this is the left shot. This was the coronary sinus I was targeting. Uh, such a narrow down coronary sinus, but with a good big branch. But it was a very narrow QRS sin sinus here. So we, I put in a the catheter directly into that uh, uh, branch with difficulty, but I was able to cannulate it. And I did the left bundle pacing also. This is the video of the left bundle pacing. We can see that and we gave a lot CRD to this patient. Dr. Mehta, can we uh, summarize yes. and... Yeah. We are last like sir. Yep. Very good. I am one of the co-authors to the guidelines. This is one of my pride moment uh, for the HRS. <laughs> I, I, I take back my comments. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir, this is the last time. So the wider the QRS, we may like a 
but we like her when it is narrower, right? That is our main result. We should do that. Thank you so much for your attention. Over to Dr. Padar sir, moderate the second session, invite the second speaker. So I would request uh, Dr. Parin Sodi ma'am to stick to 20 minute timeline so that we can have some uh, time for questions in other session. So questions will be taken at the end of both the lectures. I am sorry I can't introduce the, this subject as, in as romantic way as Dr. Kalra introduced the first subject. The region being first, heart is a romantic matter and second, he is a poet. So, I am failing in both the topics. So, but it's a very interesting subject of ODS, obstructive defecation syndrome. Many patients of ODS recently diagnose as constipation and treat in not uh, 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 the appropriate way. And his speaker is, I think, very much uh, famous, Dr. Praveen Sodhi. She is a senior consultant in the Department of Laparoscopic and Gen Minimal Invasive Surgery at Indraprasth Apollo Hospital and she has a special interest in <coughs> breast surgery and anorectal surgery. And this subject, I think she will dwell in uh, detail, but just suffice to say that we need to diagnose this subject, uh, this uh, uh, disease by proper investigations like MR defecography or maybe manometry. And then in some subjects we may require surgery if properly diagnosed. So Dr. Praveen Sodhi, over to you. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Badar for the wonderful introduction. And Dr. Vita, thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, there are times when Dr. Vita has done a challenging case and she discusses the how she did it. Did it. That sounds like magic. The way she does her case, it sounds like magic. Aaj maza aake talk to So, it's not a long talk. So, obstructive defecation. So, we've seen this movie. Most of us would recognize the movie Konsi hai. Anybody remembers the Konsi movie ka scene hai? If we have seen this movie, we can understand Joyce Kapp, for the main protagonist, Amitabh Bachchan, his whole life revolves around where his bowel happens and he holds everything which goes wrong in his life, he holds it, he holds his colon, his bowel habits is responsible for that. That is the kind of life many people are leading and we briefly talk about this syndrome. So, ODS or obstructive defecative syndrome. It's basically a kind of chronic constipation characterized by fragmented stools. There is a need for straining or defecation. They have a feeling of incomplete evacuation. They may have tenesmus and urgency. Pelvic heaviness is very common. Self-digitation is found in many patients. Self-digitation in females with rectocele, uh, they may, you know, press on the posterior lateral wall, straighten the rectocele and then they say stool pass over that. Sometimes they may press on the perineum which straightens the rectum and that helps them pass stool. There are some people who would be doing a manual evacuation. So different kinds of self-digitation. So two or more of these factors could be present along with chronic constipation when we can term it as an ODS. Majority of patients suffering from ODS are females. So causes, there are many causes which can cause ODS, of which endocrine, neurological and drugs are there. But the ones which you really need to, which are really common are the psychological, the functional and the structural causes. Amongst the psychological causes you have anxiety, depression, PTSD and sexual abuse at a young age. Pelvic dysenergy is the functional cause of ODS and structural where the surgeons come in are the rectal prolapse, rectal seal, rectal intersusception, rectal mucosal prolapse or a solitary rectal ulcer. Even large hemorrhoids can be a cause for ODS as we see in our practice. Now, for a young trigger happy surgeon, it becomes very easy to operate these structural findings we say. But we must remember, ODS is an iceberg syndrome. When I say iceberg syndrome, is a small part of it, the iceberg is outside the water what we see, but a major part is under the water which is hidden from our eyes. So the rectocele, the rectal mucosal prolapse, 
the easily detectable uh, part are the emerging rocks. And we can hurry up and go in for surgery for these things. But the surgical ship is likely to sink because of certain underwater hidden rocks. The long standing anxiety, uh, tight spastic puberatalis muscle are the important causes for strain. As the patient continues to strain for weeks, months, and years, there occurs a weakness and descent of the tissues, and organ descent occurs. When this occurs, this stretches the pudendal nerve, and gradually pudendal neuropathy will take place. After that, the next process which happens is a, rectal, a sense of rectal hyposensation. So the person finds it difficult to stimulate the rectal wall and evacuation of stool. And this finally forms the entire syndrome of ODS, where the patients are finally have to be in the you have to manage you know, a long multimodality treatment. So, uh, how to work up a patient with ODS? A good history and a good examination is important. That can never be undermined. There are various tests which, have, which can help us diagnose, of which we have anal manometry, we have dithicography, which may be uh, video dithicography or uh, MRI dithicography, which is more common these days, and certain tests like the six markers test. So, a brief, uh, I tell you, we have, I'm sorry. So, is it okay? So that is a normal uh, inodectal manometry. So normally what happens is during the squeeze pressure, right? Now I've pressed the pressure of the anus is about 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury. During a good squeeze, it rises to 1.5 times that. And during the evacuation, the rectal pressure should rise, but the anal pressure should come down. That's how the person is able to evacuate well. If we were to look at this one, this is a normal inodectal manometry. But a patient who has anismus, this arrow shows that the anal pressure rises during the uh, evacuation phase. So this patient would have anosmus and difficult to pass through. So that is how anal manometry would help us in diagnosing these patients. Then dithicography. Uh, this is not a very clear picture, I'm so sorry. This is the rectum in the normal resting phase. During squeeze, this is the inner rectal angle which forms. Now, when the person has to evacuate, this angle must increase. This was an almost a 90 degree angle, this increases. That facilitates simplification. But patients with anosmus, patients with high puberectalis, patients with ODS, this angle will reduce at the time of evacuation. So that again helps us in diagnosing this syndrome. Treatment, always start with conservative treatment. These are very basic things, but then we have to reiterate and make sure patient makes lifestyle changes to help uh, overcome the disease. So plenty of fiber, water, bulky laxatives are the mainstay of treatment. Rectal irrigation does help these people, but we must remember that a chronic abuse of self-administered enemas can lead to microtrauma and then can cause anal fibrosis or even solitary rectal ulcers. So rectal irrigation, although a good effective procedure, it can be risky, so we don't generally advise patients with this. Exercise will help these patients. Pelvic flow and abdominal muscle relaxation exercises really help these patients. Generally, we have physiotherapists who teach them these exercises. Nowadays, there is a biofeedback mechanism wherein there is a probe which is inserted per inch into the rectum. Patient can actually see the pressures and how the pressures come down with the exercises. So, biofeedback really helps these patients. Psychological counseling. Now, when we are talking to the patient, taking the history, we can assess that some of them are anxious or maybe having OCD or depressed. Make sure these patients are assessed by a psychologist and if need be, they can go for further treatment. That will again help them in treating the ODS. Some people have used botulinum toxin into the puberatalis. Trans anal lateral stimulation of the pedental nerve also may help. Small rectal changes, recto rectal interceptions and rectal mucosal prolapse can also be treated conservatively. You don't have to go in for surgery immediately. Only when the, these lesions become large enough and all other conservative modalities have been tried, that is when we think about surgery. So management outlines the aims of procedures which we do in these cases are basically four. One is a resection, plication or pexy of the rectal mucosa which helps with the redundant mucosa. Secondly, reinforce the vaginal, rectovaginal septum where there is a rectocele. Some people perform a kind of a surgical irrigation. 
or they could be a myotomy of the involved nerves. So for the surgical indication, appendicostomies are known for anti-grade debarge, but that seems like a very radical procedure to be done for these patients because the patient is left with an entrostomy in that case. Uh, myotomy of the tubular pelvis muscle can be done transperineally or even a pacing, a sacral neuromodulation can be done by pacing. These are it's a minimally invasive procedure. Now we come to the common surgical procedures which we perform for these patients. So they are basically you have a rectal prolapsectomy or a mucosectomy to take out the uh, prolapsing mucosa. We could do a concertina like ligation of the rectal mucosa, which again helps these patients. Ventral rectopexy, be it open, laparoscopic or robotic, is a wonderful procedure with those having a significant prolapse. Anterior, anterior levatoplasty plus those having a lot of collapse can go for a sigmoid resection also and in our practice we see a lot of them they benefit with simple laparoscopic, laparoscopic ventral ectopexy a lot of patients are taken up for these procedures then we come to the minimal invasive techniques the stapling techniques of which the most common star that's a staple transanal resection rectopexy here we basically use the same stapler which we use for staple uh, neurodectomy, the same stapler, two staplers are used. One is for the anterior rectal wall, one is for the posterior rectal wall and a significant amount of excessive excess rectal mucosa is excised and patients have a very good uh, symptomatic relief after this. Transstar is a specially designed circular stapler which takes out all this tissue in a single go. We never use it over here though. But in our practice, I have seen that stapled hemorrhagectomy itself also has a good response. There are a few studies to report that the, the, the scoring of uh, ODS does improve after doing stapled hemorrhagectomy. And we have a study going on in our department also, we monitored about 40 41 cases, wherein people with significant hemorrhoids, we assessed their uh, modified rhombo score for obstructive defecation before surgery. And just in the state of hemorrhagectomy, they are showing a significant reduction in their scores. So, the study is still going on, we need another year to complete the study. So, staple hemorrhagectomy in patients with significantly big hemorrhoids can also be considered. It would help the patients. In conclusion, the take home message is that the outcome of surgery alone for ODS will never be sufficient. It will be okay in the short term, but eventually the symptoms will relapse because the occult lesions would have been neglected. The psychosomatic component of ODS must always be recognized and managed. Conservative treatments must be tried before we go into surgical treatment. A holistic approach is important and a multidisciplinary approach wherein you have the, the physicians, the gastroenterologists, the psychiatrists, uh, physiotherapists and lastly the surgeons. The surgical role comes very late in these cases. So I think I have not bored you. This was a very short talk. And that is how we go towards the end of the video. That's how I'm interested at the end of the project. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Praveen. I think you can join here. Yes, Dr. Karva, you can come here. Light jalan. Light yeah, first I think. So we will uh, start uh, with the first question answer session of the first talk. Uh, it was a wonderful talk uh, by Dr. Barita Rora, ma'am. Uh, <coughs> welcome everyone. Uh, before we go to the table number one, uh, sir, Dr. Mangla, sir, Dr. Amish Vora, sir. Our, uh, our, uh, yeah. Give a big hand to Dr. Amish Vora, our uh, worthy oncologist, our favorite oncologist. Thank you. <coughs> Today I will not ask the question as my habit is, but I just wanted to share, uh, Vanita ma'am was the first one who introduced me to uh, CRT yeah. devices for my father-in-law. And I remember uh, before meeting her, I had taken three, four other opinions. Finally, I followed her. And after uh, you know, she put the device in my father-in-law, he lived for eight more years when he was already 15 years into talent. <laughs> and she is always approachable, always you know will give solutions. And I always remember that, ma'am, you know from my family, I wanted to thank you, and I thought there cannot be a better forum than this. Thank you so much. And I just say that I counted the device. Shocked him 17 times and all 17 times he survived. Yeah. So I think you know it's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
वंडरफुल फॉर शेयरिंग योर एक्सपीरियंस डॉक्टर अमीश सर जी मैं स्टार्ट करूं या यू कैन यू कैन अंडरस्टैंड द रेस्टलेसनेस फ्रॉम द पोएट या या फ्रॉम द पोएट टॉप ट्रेनर कांग्रेस सर ओवर टू यू कहते हैं मैं भी घूम में जुबान रखता हूं या इलाज ये बात रहा क्या है सर माय माय ऑल all a plot to dr vinita she has been my friend my colleague for so many years and what a elaborate lecture she has given of course uh, little innovated five minutes extra dr johan has chalan you <laughs> well uh, uh, just wanted to know that in cases of uh, uh, heart failure we have two categories uh, reduced ejection fraction and the preserved Which one is better to treat and which is the difficult one? When you don't have preserved ejection fraction or reduced ejection fraction heart failure, having a normal heart is much better, right? But uh, I would definitely say, sir, that managing patients with reduced ejection fraction is is uh, my forte. But preserved ejection fraction confuses me a lot. Because it's a newly identified identity, uh, you don't know what to do, uh, whether to give diuretics or not give diuretics, whether to decrease the LV size or uh, have a full LV. So uh, how do you manage it? There are drugs also being developed in preserved ejection fraction. We are having some positive results of so army. I've seen some studies, and uh, but uh, I don't know. It confuses me. So I have to reduce my questions to minimum because my other friends will ask more questions. My uh, another question is about the, we have in asthma a staging uh, process, stage one, stage two, stage three, and all. We have step up treatment. So in stage one of for heart failure and and by stage class one, class two, class three, do we have any any protocol? That in class one we have to give this, and then we have to add the next one, the third one, and the fourth one. Any such uh, protocol do you have? Yes, like, sir. The like guidelines. Yes, and R, yes, and BB for all, and then we have to add on, or or we have FGLT for all, and we have to add on. Just uh, confusion a uh, little bit. Yeah, sir. Yes, and ARB for all used to be my earlier go-to. Uh, yeah. Now it's RB for all. In all classes, and SGLT too, definitely for all. So these two drugs definitely come uh, first and foremost, and uh, not to miss the beta blockers, we have to give uh, diuretics, MRAs, and uh, digoxin have have taken a back seat in more symptomatic patients. But I've seen even if the patient has uh, NIH class one and ejection fraction is around 30%. You start these patients on RP, SGLT2 inhibitors, and beta blockers. This cocktail gives you a beautiful result. You don't need these patients on that. So, I don't have any experience about very sick wear to work. Oh, yeah. So just I want to know: Is it uh, Viagra for the heart, failing heart? <laughs> Sir, have you used Flavidum? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, mechanism of Flavidum, I have never understood till now. It's metabolic. Similar is nocebo, but it works. It produces more of nitric oxide and vasodilation. The nitric oxide, the nitric oxide it, it is also Viagra is okay. So I will stop short my questions because my other friends are likely to ask. Uh, Doctor Vedha, I have uh, some questions for as sir mentioned. Heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. For which data came last year on SGLT2 inhibitor. My questions uh, are related to uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. You mentioned lot of drugs. Right? You mentioned beta blocker. You mentioned diuretics. <coughs> you mentioned SGLT2 inhibitor. You mentioned RD. You become a fan of RD. I wanted to know what is your approach of using these agents in heart failure? Is it a slam bang approach? You use all of them at the same time, or you have a step up approach? If the pressure, blood pressure of the patient is okay, like 120, 80, 110, 70, <laughs> I start army, oxra, I mean dapa, of course, uh, and uh, I give uh, and beta blocker together. I start it together. I start it at the lowest possible dose, which means I start army 50 milligram twice a day, beta blocker 25 milligram twice a day, 
and data uh, at 10 milligram once a day. Then I step it up after two to three weeks. And of course, I do not forget to do an RFT after one week to see that uh, you know RV is working actually fine. So uh, I go all the way, and this is this stands true if the pressure is okay, sir. If the blood pressure is okay, I stand true. Uh, this is my therapy for class one, class two, class three, class four. Ma'am, uh, beautifully uh, described. I want you to know you mentioned. Uh, diabetics uh, are one of the best drugs for symptomatic relief. Unfortunately, there is no data uh, on uh, improving clinical outcomes. Right, ma'am? Absolutely. So, so, what is the role of diabetics today? Uh, symptomatic relief. Only? Yes. And when you mentioned another drug in the same breath as diabetics when you were doing your MBBS and MD, Rejoxane. What is the role of Rejoxane? Sir. If the patient is on digoxin by one of my colleagues, I don't stop it. But I do not start the patient's on Because it practically has not given us no benefit of survival or mortality benefit in the, these patients. And uh, it is good on digoxin, it is there, but we have better drugs now. Right, right. Sir, I control AF rain with beta blockers. And second drug to add now is Evabrat. Dijoxin is still coming to us. So the thing is that nobody knows how to take Dijoxin. Patients generally forget. I start half a, half a tablet of Dijoxin, 0.25 mg, half a tablet every day. Right? And they have to be very careful their potassium doesn't fall. Right? The diuresis is not over diuresis for them. Or they will develop Dijoxin toxicity. And uh, it is such a sustained drug, it is such an economical, uh, economical, really cheap drug, I would say, that they will break it into two and throw the other half up. And the active part of the joxin, we do not know in which half it is. So patient ends up missing the doses more than he ends up taking it. Then what is the use of using that drug? Right, right. Ma'am, your topic was from drugs to devices, heart failure. And I remember a very famous uh, share by Dale. Dale Dada, Tujhe Hua Kya Hai, Aakhir Is Marj Ki Dawa Kya Hai. Drugs do not suffice many times. We have to go to devices. So in your practice, ma'am, where do you put the use of devices early as soon as possible or later when there is hardly anything to gain? Uh, sir, later it is no use. We should never give a device in patients who are totally uh, having a fatigued heart and have not uh, uh, have not have kept been on heart failure for years together because then the results of devices is never as beautiful as it is when you detect them early at younger age at uh, symptoms which are NOIHA class 2 plus despite medical therapy a guideline directed medical therapy in all my patients comes first and foremost lifestyle modification has to remain pre or post device and then comes the device therapy over and above. Right ma'am. Uh, ma'am you mentioned about pacing and uh, it, 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 it will not be uh, pertinent if you do not mention about pacing here. And a lot of methods of pacing you said, um, biventricular pacing and other things ma'am. One of the cheapest ways of and physiological pacing is this bundle pacing. Your comment on that. Sir, it is that in, with a dual chamber pacemaker, instead of a CRT therapy which is a triple chamber pacemaker, with a dual chamber pacemaker you can give the, if not better, then at least the outcome of CRT to these patients. Uh, the guidelines which I showed I was a part of, sir, we have written those guidelines to say that patients who are dependent on pacing and uh, the uh, instead of giving CRT, you should give dual chamber pacing with conduction system pacing and they will, the outcome will be really good. And injection fraction really improves very nicely. Wonderful man. 10 out 10. Dr. Mangla sir. So, what are your approaching patients, you know, who have CKD uh, and also have poor injection fraction? Uh, what is the drug therapy you usually use? Do you give a uh, uh, reduced potassium, potassium binders and give RD? Or do you just, uh, what is your approach? Sir, my first approach is to take a nephro consult and our nephrologist in uh, Polo is very supportive. He believes in RD. He believes that the GFR is in the long run improved with RD. So he lets me do 
give a good dose, 50 mg twice daily of RD. This is Jeffa and potassium as a Mahalunga. You can repeat the, uh, it after 4 days. I will take care of it by giving K binders or however I can manage. I will do that. And sir, trust me, when you start these patients on RD, the creatinine does not go jump up till it is already there. You know, and if you start at the actual creatinine of 2, you start uh, RD. I started with very scared, but if the pressure is okay, and even at the creatinine of 2, you start RD. I haven't seen it jumping from 2 to 4 or 5. I've seen it jumping from 2 to 2.2 and then up subsequently it settles down. <laughs> so there is a data to show that GFR in fact improves with the RD. MRAs, do you combine them with MRAs? No. MRAs I hold back. I hold back. Even as our patients are not very really used to uh, doing the electrolyte that frequently, I think there is always a risk because potential is, doesn't spread. Definitely. There is a risk. But hyperkalemia is not more than uh, what is caused by ACE inhibitors or ARAs. It is not over and above that, sir. Mutra hi hota hai, jitna ke saath. Dr. Bhalla, sir. Uh, Dr. Pulsi, sir. Finally, sir. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. So, that was a wonderful talk, Dr. Vinita, as usual. So, four fundamental drugs, IGF-2 inhibitors, beta blockers, MRAs, and RAS inhibitors. Can we add three more? I'm talking about Ivabradine, I'm talking about SGC, and I'm talking about the GLP-1 analogs. See, they are also cardioprotective drugs. And uh, my friend Dr. Mangla talked about, uh, you know, Arnie's in uh, uh, CKD. So these are renoprotective drugs. Arnie's are renoprotective drugs. See, even if you combine with MRAs, the hyperkalemia does not occur. So these are really good drugs to be used now. And I'm talking about the GLP-1 agonist, semaglutide and chisaparatide, which are twin protein, have CV health and CV, you know, events, they reduce CV events and uh, even in non-diabetic patients, see, look at this, uh, the select trial, the sustained trial and the step trial in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. These are marvelous drugs to be used today. And uh, now there was a cross trial which talked about the HLG inhibitors with GLP agonists and MRAs versus RAS inhibitors and the you know, usual conservative treatment. And they said 35% risk reduction seen with when you combine MRAs and even CKD progression is reduced when you combine. All cause mortality also reduced. This was the cross trial which talked about the uh, SGLP2 inhibitors, the GLP1 agonists, and the MRAs versus the RAS inhibitors and the conventional treatment. Uh, Arnis, of course, are superior to ACE inhibitors because, especially in heart failure, you see, uh, reducing mortality, heart failure admissions, and should it replace the ACE? I believe it should. What do you say? Huh? Okay, I'm uh, talking about digoxin. See, when I was interning and doing my residency also, and you were, you used to give Lasix and Lasix and Lasix and a digoxin. <laughs> Sadly, we lost a lot of patients. And, uh, but what about non digital is like drugs? See, I'm referring to the Mirron which is improves cardiac contractility, improves cardiac output uh, without you know, compromising the oxygen consumption. Just talk a little uh, regarding non-digital drug like the Milunon. Sir, Milunon is a very good drug, but uh, IV Milunon is available. Yeah. 
that is given to patients for 24 hours. If the patient requires milanol for more than 24 hours, the mortality rate is very high in these patients. Okay, if nothing works, probably that does work. Okay. Uh, regarding my friend Dr. Karma talked about the SGC. So uh, it reduces, it improves cardiomyocyte functions and uh, it reduces inflammation by increasing the endogenous nitric oxide, as you correctly said. Sensitivity reduces CV mortality and heart failure hospitalization as well. Regarding the diet, devices now. So uh, you talk about heart failure with atrial fibrillation. Probably would you not ablate before you give a CRT, ma'am? And if you ablate, would you do a you know pulse field ablation as compared to the thermal ablation now? This seems to be the you know the future of ablation. Okay. Sir, first of all, the ablation with the heart failure patients. Yes, sir. Fibrillation happens. Yes, sir. Heart failure patient, the ablation of atrial fibrillation with heart failure patient is actually AV nodal ablation. So that these patients, they pace 100%. We make right. them, these patients, dependent on pacing. In case you are giving a CRT to a patient who has atrial fibrillation and you do not ablate, Whatever medicine you use, absolutely, the CRT is never going to work. I wanted to hear that from you. Yes. Great. So, talk uh, us through, you know, recent advances in the Heart Rhythm Conference last year, uh, the CSP. <laughs> so, so the conduction system pacing, hips and left bundle branch block as an alternate to biometric pacing, is this superior? Uh, so there is no head-to-head -head trial, but it is coming. We have a trial coming up which is called left versus left. Because the CS lead is in the left side, the left bundle pacing is on the left side, left bundle, when we pace the left bundle. This trial is known as left versus left. The uh, uh, results should be presented in the CSHR. Yes. Okay. Okay, my last question will be regarding the LP, Dr. Kala would know, versus the TVP. So, Abbott's new and Medtronic 2 has come up with a dual chamber, you know, uh, leadless pacemaker. So, talk us through that leadless pacemaker. My last question to you. Hold on. Okay. Sir, so leadless pacemaker Medtronic has been in the picture for quite some time. 2016 was the first dual year. chamber. Yes, sir. The dual chamber pacemaker came up. Just a group last, uh, last, uh, last year, July? No, sir. Uh, it's been no. about two years now. Single chamber was there, dual chamber. Yeah, dual chamber, sir. That is a VDD pacemaker actually. Okay. It's not a true dual chamber. Yeah. Because it, is a, it senses the upper chamber and paces the lower chamber. And the uh, AV conduction which is there, the AV synchrony which is there, it is maintained for about 80% of the time, not 100%. Abbott is coming out with a dual chamber pacemaker. There. There, uh, it will be available, commercially available in India uh, by uh, early next year. 2015 they have come. Right, 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 no, 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 no. Uh, and uh, I always quote uh, that uh, advertisement, Marathi quote, Tata Iron Serial Company, wonderful uh, advertisement, wonderful serial on Google search, and in the end uh, they used to say, we also make steel. I hope you are also doing interventions. <laughs> Yes. What was that? Yes. Sir, I, uh, I revised uh, my thought process about intervention and structural heart. So, I am doing endoplasties and I am doing uh, TMVRs, the towers, everything structural heart is being done. I have become the part of the program. Yeah, good ma'am. You mentioned we thought you are only doing heart failure and nothing else. No, no, ma'am is doing intervention.